The words of Jesus in today's gospel, <clears throat> gospel will be read simultaneously in various languages as we hope the early Christians might have experienced and felt with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Would those people take their places that are going to read for me? And if the congregation would like to follow along, I invite you to just read the words of Jesus as um, our gospelers do. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. <clears throat> when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you, guys. You did a fantastic job. Woohoo! Thank you all. And I want especially to thank Beth and Mercedes for painting the church doors red. Woo! And it doesn't stop there for making our Holy Spirit streamers that we had, you saw today. And to thank all of our, we're not exactly sure what to call you yet, liturgical streamer waivers or something. <laughs> and thanks to everybody here for your enthusiasm and for wearing red today to help us celebrate Pentecost, red, signifying fire and blood, energy, strength, power, determination, passion, desire, and love. Our new red doors signify to all the community and the world outside us that this is a place of sanctuary, refuge, and safety, a spiritual oasis offering to all physical aid and spiritual protection. There comes a moment in every baptism that we do here at St. George's that simply takes my breath away. It is that moment when we sing out to the Holy Spirit to come, our souls inspire, to lighten with celestial fire. It is a sacred moment. It symbolizes our need to pause, to quiet, to empty, as we, the gathered assembly, pray for pure God, for God in the raw, to have God's own way with us, to fill us and to clothe us with power from on high. The holiness of that moment always takes my breath away. It also scares me because I've seen what God and the Holy Spirit can do. Because when the Holy Spirit decides to show up, all bets are off. The one thing you can be sure of, the only thing you can be sure of, is that somebody's going to change or something is about to change. When we invoke the Holy Spirit in church on Sundays, and we'll do that in a few moments when we celebrate the Eucharist, in that moment called the epiclesis, when we call down the Holy Spirit, well, in those moments, writer Annie Dillard wants to know if we even have the foggiest idea about the sort of power that we so blithely invoke. We should all be wearing crash helmets, she says. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. 
The disciples in today's lesson from the book of Acts might just agree with that assessment. The last thing Jesus told them before he ascended into heaven was to go back to Jerusalem and to wait there for God's promises to come true. They would be baptized by the Holy Spirit, he said, and they would be clothed with power from on high. And with little or no idea what that even meant, they did as they were told. They went back to Jerusalem, but not to the temple, but to an ordinary room in an ordinary house. And there they waited, along with the women who had come with them, including Jesus' own mother and his brothers. It had been 10 days since the ascension. Can you imagine the conversations that must have taken place in that room? How would they know when the power had fallen upon them? Would it tingle? Would it hurt? How did the Holy Spirit go about baptizing people exactly? Jesus had said something about fire. But what kind? Spiritual fire or real fire? Well, as it turned out, they did not have to wait long to find out. On the day of Pentecost, a Jewish festival set 50 days after the Passover. They were all together in one place when they got a crash course in power from on high. There was a sound from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind that filled the entire house. Wind like the wind that made the dry bones come to life again. There appeared to them tongues as of fire resting upon each of them. Fire like the pillar that led the Israelites in the desert. And tongues like those at Babel. But this time, what sounds like Babel is intelligent speech. Better yet, it is gospel. It is pure spirit. It is God in the raw. And there is no mistaking it for anything else. And absolutely everyone there knows it. According to the book of Acts, 3,000 people were baptized that day. It was a miracle. It was what we know as the birthday of the Christian church, and it gives us a sense of what Pentecost power can mean, a before and after view of what the Holy Spirit, what God in the raw, what pure spirit can do. Before Pentecost, the disciples were fearful bunglers who ran away at the first sign of trouble. Afterwards, they were fearless leaders. They received power from on high, and with it, they turned the world upside down. What happened in that room that day spread across Jerusalem, and from there it went across nations and centuries and cultures. It happened by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Scripture talks about this power in at least two ways. First, as the abiding presence of Christ, as safety and comfort. This is the spirit that most of us know and love, the spirit of peace and concord, the one that soothes our ruffled feathers and revives our weary souls, the one that, lo, is with us always, whenever we have the good sense to just breathe in and say thank you. But there is another way that the Spirit behaves. It is the Spirit who blows where it will, the Spirit that drove Abraham from his fields and flocks to the open roads where there are no markers and where neither distance nor direction can be readily measured. The Spirit that drove Moses into the desert beside the fire that burned but did not consume and that changed his life forever. The Spirit that drove Jesus into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days and nights right after he was baptized. Yes, that Spirit. Ask anyone who was in that ordinary room on that first Pentecost 
what it felt like to be caught up in the spirit and see if it's something they'd like to happen every Sunday morning. <laughs> Only a fool would pray for the Holy Spirit, says Alan Jones, the former dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Only fools for Christ do, he says. He says that the spirit is most present at three open spaces in our lives, in the unpredictable, in the place of risk, and in those areas over which we have no control. Which is where the disciples were. And to be honest, where we are more times than we would like to admit. Not only as individuals, but also as members of the church founded thousands of years ago. It is no crime to pray for the gentle spirit, to ask God to restore predictability, to remove us from risk, to give us back the comfortable illusion of control that helps us sleep a little better at night. But today, Pentecost is our reminder that there is another side to the spirit for which we all pray one that could set our heads and our hearts on fire, one that transforms our lives, that turns the world as we know it upside down, and it is not predictable. If you've ever seen the movie Chef, it was released a couple of years ago, then you know that it's a Pentecost kind of movie. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it, even if you're not a foodie like me. It's about Carl Casper. He's a creative cook whose foods and flavors come together in masterpieces. Well, Carl lands his dream job. So one day he is on the A-list of up-and-coming restaurant chefs. And the next, he finds himself stuck in a rut tied to the same menu over and over again because the owner of the restaurant where he works thinks that it's safer and that it has a proven track record with his clients and the diners there. And so, well, Carl gets fed up and then he blows up and then he has a food fight with a restaurant critic who gave him a bad review and he gets fired. He winds up on a food truck, and in the process, he discovers a new life, and he rediscovers his passion. It's a wonderful movie that also challenges us to consider how we try to navigate and discern all the voices in our lives, those who love and support us no matter what the critics who never seem to realize the damage they inflict, and usually under the guise of being helpful. And then there are the random strangers, the unexpected voice that often is pure spirit, God in the raw, and that we may sometimes prefer to overlook. May I remind you that we at St. George's began this year at our annual meeting, considering what it might mean to us to live a spirit-filled life, wondering what it could mean if we prayed for the spirit's presence and then dedicating ourselves to getting out of its way. Well, yes, (laughs) it's been crash helmet time. (laughs) It hasn't always felt comfortable or safe, and certainly not easy. Closing the academy was a painful chapter. And yet, here we are, a few short months later, and we are in conversations with several groups who hope to come and share our campus with us, exciting, life-giving and life-affirming groups who are dedicated to the same things that we are about, to making a difference in this world, in this community, to transforming lives. 
I feel the signs of the Spirit all around us, especially this anniversary year. And each week, I always, always see the gospel lived out in our lives. Just this past week, Joyce Swaving and I visited the original church at Heritage Hill Park. We wanted to check out the logistics for our, for our upcoming June 5th worship service and picnic that's going to be held there. So we met with this young park ranger named Bradley. Bradley was busy reminding us of all the constraints we face because basically we're asking them for a special favor. We're asking them to open up the park on Sundays, a day that it is normally closed. And so there are all sorts of considerations, overtime pay, insurance, reduced hours, extra help to set up, more extra help to take down. So we said, okay, Bradley, we'll, we'll take care of it. We'll do all that. And then he called me again the next day to go over it all again, all the constraints, the agreement. And in what can only be described as a movement of the Holy Spirit, he told me, that the park had decided to waive all fees for us if, he said, if we would agree that this would not be a private party, if we would be willing to let anyone into the park who wants to be there to worship with us that day. <laughs> this is a problem, I said. <laughs> like I said, it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> there are so many signs of new life among us and within us. So the question is, do we have the heart to keep praying for spirit-filled lives? Because asking for an experience of the Holy Spirit is only part of the equation. The other part is recognizing it when it comes. Or do we prefer to be more like the folks in the old, old story? It's a story about farmers who were facing the worst drought they had ever experienced. Their crops were failing, their land had turned to dust, and they were desperate. As a last resort, they called upon the local priest, and they asked him to hold a worship service so that they could pray for rain. And so they all showed up at the appointed time, on the designated day, and they got the shock of their lives when instead of prayers, the priest challenged them, where are your umbrellas? We don't have to know all the answers right now. We just need to keep asking ourselves, what does it mean to be a spirit-filled community, a community that gives life in this, our 125th year? Where are the signs of new life among us, and how do we nurture it? Where do we see love, and how do we make more of it? Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he breathed upon them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. But the peace of Christ is no peace at all. Receive the Holy Spirit. It is fire and life. It is energy and passion. It is creativity and chaos. It is risky and it is beyond our control. We are free to resist it, and we are free to open ourselves up to it. If we want to be fools for Christ, that is. If we want to be clothed with power from on high. Happy Holy Spirit Day. Amen. <laughs>